Hi. So why don't you guys tell me about this amazing film of yours? I can't wait to hear all about it. And whoever wants to begin can begin. Yeah, sure. Uh, what well, you're, you, I think you're pointing at me. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> I feel like that's where the hands are. <laughs> right there. Oh, no, it's me, isn't it? Uh, so hi, I'm Nicola Rose. I'm the director of the film and one half of the producers. Um, Tierney is the other producer. And um, I wrote this film originally back in 2013 and then uh, was compelled to get it out of the mothballs in 2020, right when COVID hit. And that was the beginning of it becoming a real film that we put into a very accelerated pre-production, then production, and then shot in June 2021, almost exactly one year ago today. Um, so amid COVID, you know, quarantining people together in a couple of Airbnbs that also doubled as our production space, that also, you know, we're, we're half of our locations ultimately. And um, just to talk about the content of the film a little bit, as you may know, it has to do with a young woman played by Lizzie, who uh, has a very messy growing up experience uh, between two countries, America and France, specifically New York and Paris, which is where she has always wanted to go. She tries her hand at Parisian life, at being an au pair, and naturally everything that can go wrong does go wrong. <laughs> I call it a not quite romantic comedy because she falls in love along the way and that's the heart of the story. Ah, nice. Now who wants to add next? Tierney, Lizzie? Lizzie, go ahead. No, Lizzie. Do you have, yeah, talk a little bit about your character maybe. Absolutely. So Claire is a filmmaker puppeteer who is unsatisfied in New York and has this this deep down dream of going to Paris and uh, encounters a man that she is whose aura whose career she is inspired by and that is the the jumping off point and as well as her her best friend who also who also inspires her to go and, and goes with her on this journey um when they when they embark on this this trip to Paris and this following of uh of an, a man that she's inspired by in love with. Nice, very nice. Tierney, do you have anything you want to add? Oh, what should I add? Um, I do the probably the most boring job, but also- You got it I made. I get to be That's involved so in every aspect. So um, it's, uh, it's really gratifying. And Nicola said, you know, she's the director, but she's also the writer. She also edited, co-produced, with me, producing partner, um, we pretty much the two of us put everything together. This was on a lower budget during COVID. Um, every little bit of the film was planned between the between the two of us, and uh, it was I. You know, we love digging into it. I mean, literally down to wardrobe, choosing wardrobe for the various characters for the scenes, production design. We just, we didn't have a big team. Once the big team got into place, they um, implemented everything beautifully. We had a wonderful crew. Everybody was like, it was like a family. It, it, was, it was just the best experience ever. Nice. Now, other than filming this during COVID, what were some of the biggest challenges about making and starring in the film? For Well, that last part's more for Lizzie, but... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that um, the gift of this film and also the greatest challenge is that although Nicola and I are two different people and we've had very different experiences in the world, like I was also the girl bumbling through Paris. I was also the girl bumbling through relationships I shouldn't have been a part of. I was also the girl bumbling around, you know, being 19. And so that brought up all of these like very, very tender emotions that that come with that time in your life. And going back to that time, um, once again, like that is the, the core and why I'm so grateful to have been in this film, but also um, was really difficult to kind of like put yourself in all the time. And so, yeah, that that's. Nice. Yeah. 
it does bring up all this stuff. I, you know, because I think we've all been that person at one point who is just literally royally screwing up every <laughs> of the way. And, you know, if, if you haven't, I mean, God bless you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not had some version of this experience where everything we do is wrong. And then we come out at the other end and we're, and we're like, hey, I'm still standing. I'm still here. I'm actually a little stronger for having had these experiences of being a sort of adolescent adult. Um, I think one of the challenges to go back to your original question, obviously COVID played into this and you did say other than COVID, but related to that was just the fact that this was, as Tierney mentioned, a lower budget film. It was being done on limited means, um, a sort of combination of private equity and crowdfunding, but still a very modest budget. And you know, our uh, executive producers, everybody was enormously helpful, but we were still limited in certain ways that required us to get really creative. We mentioned the Airbnb thing, like the Airbnbs that were both our um, locations and also where we were lodging the crew and the cast, you know, in sort of roommate situations sometimes in order to be in quarantine. Um, some of the other aspects that we ended up having to be more creative for were simply, um, you know, script revisions, uh, putting things, uh, combining locations into one so that things would not be so very expensive. In my, in my original iteration of the script, I think there was like a world figure skating championships that was going on. This obviously <laughs> had to be you know, minimized. Um, things we did like get the skating rink, though. We did shoot in a skating rink. We just didn't have the world championships with it was it was a smaller affair. Yeah, we did we did film and and we did have a real figure skater who was the stunt double, if you will, who was performing the the actual double axle and so forth. Um, you know, that's not our actor; just really looks like our actor. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, I forget because it does feel very seamless. And so, yeah, there were just all sorts of things along the way. For some reason, they're not all coming to mind right now, but there were definitely stuff. There were things that had to be minimized down. Um, you know, uh, this this does come back to COVID again, but it's also just sort of a personnel thing. Uh, scenes that were going to have huge numbers of people that for one reason and another had to be boiled down to like seven people. And our job is to make that work and not look like seven people, which I think we did Oh my gosh, I forgot the biggest one. We were going to go to Paris and we could not go to Paris. I was going to say that. It's going to... <laughs> yeah. Do you want to talk about that or do you want me to talk about that? No, go ahead. So we we did not end up, we, we couldn't plan ahead for a place that we didn't know if Americans were going to be allowed to travel at that time. Right, right, yeah. So, you know, COVID again. So we had to essentially figure out how could we fake Paris? Because there was no taking the story out of this city because the whole thing is here's Claire, this fish out of water, this girl that goes from America to, to Paris. We're not gonna have her go to Des Moines, you know, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> so, you know, we're trying to think, okay, how do we do this? And it was honestly just a clever mix. I have Tierney to thank for much of this because she literally went on Google uh, Earth and was finding locations in New York with walls that looked like Paris, sides of buildings that looked like sides of Parisian buildings that Claire could walk by. You know, this is near our chief Airbnb and this looks pretty Parisian. And I'd be like, you know, it does. <laughs> Um, you know, because we had it in our budget to do this travel, but we couldn't do it. So we put that budget toward things that were ultimately more important, like really, really good finishing services, really good uh, locations and so forth in, in the US. Um, it didn't matter that we didn't go to Paris. In fact, one of our actresses who is Parisian and who was just looking at some bits of this film said to me, I can't believe you guys didn't go to Paris. I feel like you went to Paris and she's from there. So that meant so much to me. She was like, I thought I was at home. I was like, that's what we want you to feel. That's the whole point. And we did that on very little money. Nice. And where exactly did you film? We you shot in, in Harlem, New York City. Okay, okay. We rented two brownstones and an apartment uh, next door to one of them. And we arrayed ourselves and shot in those brownstones. Um, and additionally, a few other outside locations. Oh, we found some wow. lovely, beautiful locations. Yeah, that area has some pretty um, interesting places to film, so. Definitely, it really worked out. And especially the interiors in there that people don't get to see those brownstones when people haven't renovated them within an inch of their lives, they really look very European, they're very old. 
you know, um, it looks like somebody's place that might be in Paris or in Berlin or one of those mm-hmm. cities that has not renovated in that same way that American cities do. So, you know, uh, people don't get to see inside the, unless you're staying in an Airbnb or you happen to live there, but there's just so much history there on the inside of places. And we see just uh, the tip of the iceberg when we're seeing the outside of places, you know, Apollo theater and things. And what inspired this film initially when you started writing it? What was the inspiration? I met a figure skater whose life and career I was really inspired by. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I was like, well, there is no other answer to this question, unfortunately. I, I, I've gotten away at, at, in my directing life from saying, well, this is based on personal experience because let's face it, all passion projects are based on personal experience. If somebody's making a film and putting money into it and so forth, because they, it's because they want to, it's because they're personally connected. It's not because, oh, I think this will make money because it won't, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, well, maybe it will if you're very lucky, but point being, um, this, uh, you know, I didn't actually follow a guy to Paris and, you know, much of it is, is sort of artfully arranged to be more interesting than it really was in real life. But it is uh, based on just the sort of little goofball that I was at that age and just sort of wanting to get the essence of that story onto paper. In particular, my best friend back then was the most larger than life person on earth and she 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 saw me as this little lamb that needed to be guided through the the wilds of the world and she didn't know anything about the world herself so it was hilarious and she there's a scene in the movie where uh not to spoil it but where um Claire's best friend explains sex to her and Claire has already lost her virginity at this point and does not need sex explained <laughs> but her friend is going to explain sex to her anyway and she does not know the first thing about sex. And she's explaining it entirely from imagination and fears. And people don't believe this, but that conversation, except for some little tweaks I made to it, is entirely real. And it was a conversation I had in a kosher deli in the middle of Paris. <laughs> <laughs> my friend explaining the male anatomy to me in ways that suggested she had never seen uh, possibly even the female anatomy. I'm not sure. <laughs> So, you know, I, I was very lucky. I had so much to draw from that I feel like I barely had to write, which is That's great. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds like, it sounds like a combination of Emily in Paris meets when Harry met Sally with that particular scene. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Cats is deli. I didn't yes, you remember the scene, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, the, the, um, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we all know we are all grownups here. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, it's so funny. I didn't even think of that. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the thing about basing stuff on real life is that you have to be willing to lie a whole lot because people try to be very truthful and more power to them for being truthful. But this is not the time to be truthful. This is the time to entertain people and make them laugh and cry. So yes, hopefully exactly. we have hit that balance. Thanks. And Lizzie's performance hits that balance a thousand times over. Yes, it does. <laughs> Now, what's next for you, ladies? Well, I'm pointing at you. <laughs> we have uh, Nicola actually came out of um, came out of editing Petrushka and had the thing that you always get when you're coming out of a film. You get this letdown, like withdrawal. I have to keep going. What do what, what do I do now? Right, and right, she right. Actually, almost instantly, pretty close to instantly. Um, started developing a new script. So uh, that has been refined and that is now in packaging. So we are packaging, it's called Magnetosphere. Nicola, you wanna, you wanna talk just a tad about yeah. Magnetosphere? Am I, I, I didn't know how much I was allowed to say until this moment. So just a sort of <laughs> overview well, of what we're talking about. Sammy's getting the, getting the world announcement apparently. Oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> So Magnetosphere is the story of a 13 year old girl who is living with synesthesia um, and who discovers over the course of the story that this is something that she experiences. Are you familiar with what synesthesia is? Just no, no, no. That's about 50, 50 people are and aren't. I'm just, I'm sort of gauging as I go, who, who knows what this is? So synesthesia is a neurological and perceptual phenomenon where 
your senses are crisscrossed. So you like hear colors, you might see sounds, you might associate days of the week with certain colors. Like there's a book called Wednesday is Indigo Blue um, written by the call people with synesthesia, synesthetes. And so, you know, the person is talking about how like Wednesday is always blue and Monday is pink and all these things. It manifests itself differently in every single person who experiences it. And because it's perceptual, there's no real way to like compare notes on it. People try and there's an enormous group full of synesthetes on Facebook. There's like 7,000 of them. I don't experience this myself. Uh, I have a family member who does, but you know, try and compare notes, like I said. So what I did was I went into this group and I asked people, this is right around Thanksgiving last year, I asked people a ton of questions. How do you experience this? Just so that I could get an idea of how I could write it authentically, because it's it's not something I don't have the right to write about, but it is something I don't experience that I know of. So I, I might, I wouldn't know. So, you know, I wanted to hear what are these people experiencing and how can I put it down on paper so that it does feel realistic? And it, I combined this whole thing of synesthesia with a story that I had written when I was like, 15 years old that was basically just a slice of life story about a little girl moving with her family and having her first love and uh, participating in a theater production with her dad. And at the time, that was the whole story. And when Tierney saw that initial treatment, I think she said in the kindest way possible that this was a movie of the week, meaning there was literally nothing going on. <laughs> I'm not saying that defines a movie of the week. I'm saying that defines what my script was at, in 2003. So having taken this 2003 iteration, I was able to wind in the story of synesthesia, several other things that actually had a plot. And, you know, the foundation of what I had back in the day was very good. The details were not very good. And now I think I have made it so that, it, that you know, the foundation is strong and what's standing on it is also strong. And it, and it should be noted that this is, it's a, it's a teen and family comedy. It is a okay. comedy. So, and that's how Nicola writes. Every Petrushka is a comedy. <laughs> it it is. Myself. It's there. It's it's like Nicola once said, um, and and I, I don't know if I can remember this exactly. It's you know the lead characters are going through life and taking it very seriously. Meanwhile, there's all this comedic stuff going on around them. Yes, I said about Petrushka that Claire and Thibault are in one very serious, very earnest little love story, and they don't realize that they're actually in a huge comedy that everybody else around them realizes they're in. But these two earnest little souls have no friggin' clue. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is deadly serious. It is. And it's actually absurd. The whole thing is absurd. I mean, the feelings are real, and I hope we've, con I, I know you as an actress conveyed that. I hope that the story conveys it, but everything that they're surrounded by is theater of the absurd. And the two of them in the middle are the little core that are these, these heartfelt little people who <laughs> just believe in everything as being serious. What about um, you, Lizzie? Do you have anything uh, coming up? Absolutely. So I am developing, I'm also a pre-K teacher, so I'm developing a, an educational series and I love other cultures as, um, as, referenced by this film and so it's exploring different historical periods and different cultures um, and different languages different ancient languages and um, cool. so it's gonna be really exciting and also I uh, do a lot of theater so I'm in a lot of developmental projects that are coming to be and in the process of being nice are you a New York teacher too I am um, I'm not a New York teacher actually I teach um, virtually I teach oh, okay yeah okay Okay, we should talk about that. My sister um, was a preschool teacher until she had her baby. So she was looking to do doing something like that. Absolutely, absolutely. Please feel free. I would love to talk to her about that. Yeah, definitely. I'll get you guys in touch. Nice. How long have you been a teacher for? Um, For all of COVID. <laughs> Very nice. You have the personality for it. So I was going to say, I could definitely see you being some kind of teacher. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I love it. Yeah, she loves it too. So yeah, she had she went COVID happened and then she had her baby and then she's like, oh, I want to be a stay at home mommy, but totally, totally. You gotta do what you gotta do sometimes. Yes. Great. Well, we are almost out of time. So before I want before I let you go, I want each of you to describe the film in three words. Charming. That could be one word. Okay because it utterly is. Uh, 
whimsical. Okay. Good one. Pressure's on you, Nicola. <laughs> each of us gets three or one of us or each I was going to say each, each of you could get three if you want Ooh. Ooh. Oh, no. I'm really challenging you um, I would say magical whimsical and heartbreaking okay okay Lizzie you win <laughs> <laughs> I love it I would say um, not quite untrue Quite untrue. Like, I like that. Yes. <laughs> That's a good one. Very nice. Anyone else want to add another word or? No, I think we've covered it pretty yeah. well. Beautiful. Well, it was Guys. lovely. It was lovely to speak to you, ladies. Thank you so much, and best of luck on your next project. I'm proud of all three of you. Thank, Thank you, you, Sammy, so much. It was a pleasure. It's Likewise. Really nice yep. We'll talk again soon. I promise. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 All right. All right. Thank you, Sammy. And we'll see you later on uh, for the for the next one. And, yes. uh, and, and and nice to actually see you this time. Yes, <laughs> likewise. Thank you. All right. All right, okay. Sammy. Bye.